Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, a show where we talk to experts who've taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have sailed around the world to those who started thriving businesses and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. This is episode 46 with author Chris McDougall. This episode was brought to you by NewZest, a company from New Zealand I discovered there that makes some of the healthiest, yummiest, and sustainable vitamin and quality pea protein supplement powders and bars on the market. There's no GMO, no dairy, no soy, gluten, grains, artificial sweeteners, no added sugar, no preservatives, no fillers, no animal products, no bad stuff. It's all good stuff made in Belgium, Australia, or New Zealand, not in China. I'm a huge advocate for clean, healthy eating, and I also travel a lot, which is why I love taking New Zest powders and bars on the road. My favorites are their chocolate clean lean protein, the Just Fruit and Veg Mix, which actually has five fruits and five veggies inside, and a product called the Quick Vita Kick, which has all the vitamins you need to go all day long, plus protein, prebiotics, probiotics, real fruits and veggies, and digestive enzymes with only 48 calories, zero grams of sugar, and six grams of protein. The Cacao Honey Quick Vita Kick is my favorite. I kind of use it like dessert. All their powders taste great. Right now, if you use the code WILDIDEAS at newzest-usa.com, that's N-U-Z-E-S-T hyphen USA.com, you'll get 15% off every order, even repeat orders. So go to newzest-usa.com. Make sure you enter the code WILDIDEAS at checkout. This episode was brought to you by Active Skin Repair. They're a non-toxic, multifunctional skin and wound repair solution that replaces products like Neosporin, tea tree oil, and even hydrogen peroxide all in one solution so you can take less stuff with you on surf trips and adventures. I found this product created by a bunch of biotech guys who also love the outdoors. The active ingredient, Hypochlorous or HOCL, is naturally produced by white blood cells to kill 99% of bacteria within 15 seconds. It also reduces skin inflammation and helps the body heal naturally. The best part is it does it without harsh chemicals or antibiotics. You can use it on sensitive parts, and it's even reef safe and environmentally friendly. The medical team for the World Surf League is using it for reef cuts. Pro climbers are using it for hangers, cyclists for chafing and saddle sores, and even Navy SEALs are carrying it in their pack. To heal faster and go farther... Check them out at bldgactive.com. That's bldgactive.com. Chris McDougall is the author of the best-selling book, Born to Run. It's a book that helped spawn the barefoot running movement and is currently being made into a movie starring Matthew McConaughey. He also wrote the bestseller, Natural Born Heroes. We talk about life since both of his books, Some of the tactics he learned researching them, including some movement-based exercises the Cretans used, how he once had to choose between buns and mustards for his hot dogs because he was not making much money as a writer, and so much more. Chris is an amazing storyteller, so this is a bit of a longer episode, and we have some history. I met Chris in 2011 when I read his book, saw he was coming to my local bookstore, and pitched a story on him. We ended up trading surf lessons for barefoot running lessons, and it ran in the Adventure Journal thanks to editor Steve Casimiro. It taught me that you have to ask for what you want in life, and sometimes you get it, including a great mentor. Chris has not only become a mentor, but also a friend. I hope you enjoy this show. He also talks about his latest expedition, Running with Donkeys, and this is a part you don't want to miss. Enjoy. Okay, today we have on Chris McDougall, one of my all-time favorite authors in the world. Chris, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. I'm one of your favorite authors, and it took you a year 
to invite me on this podcast. Wait, I think I actually emailed you right away, but I don't know where you were. You were you were hiding out. <laughs> and you're... Yeah, well, I revealed my second thing too is, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty crap about emails. But anyway, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Good to be back. You're so welcome. Let's talk about Life Since Born to Run. First off, that book has just, it's been so fun going to outdoor retailer shows and watching the running shoe industry change because of your book. Yeah, it was pretty wild. Um, although changing back though, uh, and, and I even felt it at the time, uh, back in the sort of the intoxicating days of like the barefoot revolution. Um, I would get this like hysterical messages all the time from like the barefoot community. Like, you know, we're changing the world. I'm like, eh, this is wait a little while. It's not going to last. You know, the pendulum's going to swing. And I, I just felt it in my gut. I thought that as long as people are asking for this, then the retailers are going to give it. You know, if you want to shoot this made out of like, you know, gummy bears, they'll do it as long as people are going to buy it. They don't care. But once they want something else, goodbye gummy bears. And what I, I felt was going to happen with barefoot running is that it's really easy to buy. It's not so easy to learn. And you probably see it with surfing all the time. Like in, in cycling, they call it more, more money than miles. You know, people who buy all the shit, but don't actually ride that much. And I figured that's what's going to happen with barefoot running. Everybody's going to buy Vivo and Five Fingers, but they're not really going to invest the time into changing their running form. And when they don't, pendulum's going to swing the other way. And that's kind of what happened, you know, was all of a sudden it was all about, you know, the hokas and the, the super density cushioned shoes came hard on the heels of, um, of barefoot stuff. But right now you're running in this awesome sandal you showed me called the Luna. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so here's the thing. <laughs> you want to talk about life post born to run. What's been really cool, this is my favorite part, I think, um, of that whole adventure, uh, was it, it was so accidental and so random and so improbable. It really shouldn't have happened. And you're making that point before, too, about like, you know, you just got to show up and ask for what you want. And, and sometimes things happen. And that's really what happened with Born to Run was every step of the way, I thought that that adventure was not going to happen. There's no way Caballo is going to put on this race. There's no way I can run a 50-mile race. And when it actually happened, it was such a galvanizing experience that you know the, the people down there became so bonded uh, that now it's been – that race was 2006. It's been 11 years since that race. and. I feel like intimately like sibling related to everybody that was there. What has been so cool is to sort of go off into the world after that born to run race and keep ricocheting into each other. And one of the more unlikely stories came out of, to me, what the heart and soul of born to run is all about was the moment when barefoot Ted knelt down next to Manuel Luna and asked Manuel Luna to teach him how to make a pair of Wallachis. And at the time, we were all thinking, this is like a terrible idea. Leave this poor man alone. But there was something about Ted's manner. It was the first time he shut his mouth in three days. And so Ted comes out of the canyon after that experience, and he tells me that he's going to start a little factory making Wallachis. Of course, what I'm imagining is like everybody who goes to like Nepal on spring break is going to import like, you know, hippie pants and the business lasts 25 minutes and it's done. 11 years later, Luna Sandals is booming. Ted took the knowledge. He went to Seattle. He rented um, an open warehouse space above an old cigar factory. And he started innovating and designing these, these, these adventure sandals designed after traditional Tadomata footwear. And his Luna sandals are unbelievable. Um, and every year I tell him, Ted, dude, you've done it. It's perfect. And he's like, no, 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 I got something new. And every time he, he, he changes the design, I think, why fuck with it, man? You've got it. And every year he turns out something even better and better. So again, I'm, I'm shocked that of all people, Ted has turned that experience into this like really great like work of art that, that I really love. 
Oh, that's so cool. So we'll have to link to Luna Sandals in the show notes. Um, then your next book we read right away. So Natural Born Heroes. I love how you talk about things like, you know, there's so many lessons about movement, about how we eat, about foraging, fasting. So I, I'm kind of curious, you know, there's so many rules about how we should eat and how we should train. And like, these guys didn't really have any rules and they seem like they're the most badass men ever. For those who haven't read Chris's other book, Natural Born Heroes, uh, maybe you could just give us a quick synopsis. You know, well, that's, that's, you know it's interesting because um, I was just thinking about that recently. So, you know, when I was working on Born to Run, there's no predictor that anything's ever going to work. So, and usually, you know, books have a shelf life of like about the length of like yogurt, you know, they, they start to get old and disappear fast. And like in a month, books just vanish. So when I was finishing Born to Run before it was published, I was already working on the next project. And I think Born to Run came out in May of 2009. And I had a proposal on my editor's desk by December. Uh, even though I was on tour like nonstop like a maniac, but I had um, the next proposal in by December and it was locked in by, by January 1. So within nine months of publishing Born to Run, I had the next book already already signed on. And that one sort of sprang out of um, discarded material from Born to Run. What happened was I sent the net out as far as, far as I could, like any out of print, vintage, lost book about running adventure stories, I tried to find them. So I found one called The Creech and Runner, and I ordered it before I even really knew what it was. And I picked it up for like, what, 20 cents on, on Abe books. And when it came, I realized I made a mistake. It wasn't about a runner at all. It was about a foot messenger during World War II. So I sort of stuck it aside. Uh, I finished working on Born to Run. And after that manuscript was done, then I went back and finally read The Creech and Runner. And the story... It's about what happens on the island of Crete in World War II when German forces first invaded. Crete is the only place on the planet where the resistance began the first day. You know, usually when, when the Germans would invade, like in France and Poland, there would be sort of this shock and awe period of about nine months to a year after the army was defeated before the civilian resistance would form and fight back on Crete. As soon as the Germans are coming down their parachutes, the Cretan civilians are like grabbing farm tools and running out in the streets. And they started fighting before the Germans even got to the ground, the civilians, not the army. And they're, they're attacking these, these uh, German paratroopers as they're coming down. And when the Germans finally quelled the island, the uh, civilians went up into the mountains and they continued to fight for the rest of the war. They were relentless. And the thing about it was, right, I'm reading this story. And the Cretan runner is that one of these guys in particular, a guy named George Secondakis, who was a shepherd. And he decided, okay, I'm going to join the resistance and I'm going to run messages. And this dude, so, so just Shelby, just think about this. If someone took you today and put you up in the mountains and said, okay, tomorrow we need you to deliver a message 47 miles away through the woods. You can't use the trails because you'll be spotted. After you deliver the message, get the reply and come back. All right, so it's like 100 miles in two days through the woods, self-supported, right? You, you would die. Yep. This, this guy did this day after day after day for four years. I'm like, I'm like how, how do you do this? You know, physically, how do you pull this off? So I use that as a launching point for Natural Born Heroes. I was looking at the Cretan resistance during World War II because to me, it was like the most pure experiment in natural athleticism. And then finally, in the middle of all this, is this crazy adventure story. These guys decide, let's go behind German lines, let's capture the general, kidnap him, and take him off the island. And that's basically what the, the adventure story of Natural Born Heroes is. is I tell the story of these lunatics who decide on their own, they're going to penetrate, sneak between 80,000 German soldiers, grab the general, sneak back out between 80,000 German soldiers, and then go on the run on an island where they're being pursued by like planes and dogs and tanks and try and get this guy off the island. It, it was a really good read. Um, and then I listened to the audiobook version of it, and that guy has an amazing accent. But I want to ask you, like, what of that are you applying to your life? Like, what, what have you taken from that? Because I remember you used to be fascinated with fasting back then. 
you know, these guys just didn't eat for a couple of days and then they'd forge for food. Well, it's a couple of things. You know, I think the thing about it too, and you know, I, I think this is where you and I and, and other people are sort of all approaching the same sort of truths from different directions, or it's kind of no surprise that you mentioned Wim Hof before, or like I, I'm fascinated by Wim Hof, you know, yeah. that, and I, I think what it comes down to Shelby is I feel like real truth about fitness kind of died right around the time advertising and mass production took off. Like up until like the 1920s or 30s, whatever it was, people really knew how to get in shape. And then we started to sell each other stuff. And once we started to sell each other stuff, then all the truths were, were lost. But if you look at like old boxers, guys like, you know, like, like Joe Lewis and you know, Jack Dempsey, these guys knew how to train. And what kind of training were they doing? They're like chopping wood. They're going out in the cold all the time, always out in the cold. Um, they're doing all body weight exercises. They were never in a gym. It was always out there, tons of road work. So the knowledge was that how to eat was there too. What did Jack Dempsey have before a fight? A gigantic steak. You know, now, you know, people would sort of recoil, but actually now things are starting to, to circle back. But his idea was, what do you want? In my, what do I want in my stomach? I want saturated fat. That's a nice, long, slow burn. You know, I don't want a bunch of, of, of fly and die carbohydrates. So I feel like what I've, what I've taken from this is if I hear about something that seems like it works, I want to find out that it's got a pedigree. Uh, if you want to tell me about breathing exercises or cold immersions, I want to see over and over again throughout history where other people have used it. I don't want to hear that some dude in, in Holland just thought of it. I want to hear about the fact that uh, Buddhist monks used it, and the Tibetan warriors used it before them, and Zulu warriors used it before him. You know, so if, if it keeps turning up again and again throughout history, then I'm willing to believe that there's something there, which is why things like barefoot running or cold immersions or breath control works, because you keep finding them throughout history and throughout cultures, you know, forever. So what about diet? Because there's so much so much information right now about diet. And, and it seems like humans, you know, throughout different cultures survived off of pretty much whatever. Like we can eat whales or yeah. we can just eat broccoli and we can survive. But what makes us thrive? I like the way you put it down to it. It's either whales or broccoli. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's I'm eating plant-based, you know, and it's totally different than how I ever used to eat. And I don't know if I love it, but it's an experiment right now that I'm trying out. And um, there's this big paleo movement. There's so much going on. It's confusing. It, it is. And the, um, the best guidance I got uh, is, is someone I wrote about Natural Born Heroes because I was trying to figure this out as well. Because in Born to Run, I'm down the Copper Canyon with the Tarumara, who are essentially vegetarian. Uh, they're, they're really omnivores. Like if, you, if, if a stray cow wanders in a camp, they will eat the shit out of that cow. <laughs> no question asked. But there aren't, there aren't cows wandering around. So by necessity... They tend to eat lots of pinole, which is a heritage corn, and chia, and um, they forage for lots of uh, edible greens. So they tend to be vegetarian. And then I am in Crete, and that's like, that's like the vintage Mediterranean diet, which is lots of saturated fat, like um, lots of like fatty lamb and pork, and also um, you know, nutrient greens, so basically greens and porks. Greens and meats. So I'm trying to figure out, well, how do you, what, what's the common ground here between two groups of ultra athletes, yet with what seems to be wildly different diets? This is interesting because I'm actually going to a place where they do a lot of like plant based whole food research. And it, it is a diet high in, high in carbs, but being, you know, eating plants, you tend to not just eat as much, but you have to do it right. You can't eat like bread. It is, it is fascinating because I, I think like take, take someone like Scott Jork. You know, Scott Jork, Jork is super vegan. He just did the Appalachian Trail um, two years ago now, and I mean, imagine doing fifty plus miles a day on the AT on a vegan diet. So Scott worked like ten times as hard as anybody else in order to maintain a certain diet. Um, I don't feel that nutritionally, Todd, Scott's diet is the best, 
On the other hand, Scott won three in Western State seven years in a row. So, you know, how much are you going to second guess him? Yeah. I think one of the interesting things about that book, though, was, was there was a lot of fasting. There was time in between food where people just weren't eating. And I think that's something that I'm really interested in exploring. So we're going to switch off of diet because I think we can we could talk about this all day and I find it so fascinating, but you're also, you also learned a lot about movement and about foraging and you just talked about doing parkour. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So the the thing about it, it this is, this is, I was beefing about how we we sell each other products. You know, we, we also sell each other entertainment and and something else that really bothers me, it really bugs the crap out of me about sports is that you know, it's all become funneled into like these five major power things that we see on TV on Sunday, you know, football, baseball, hockey, you know, basketball. These are games developed by men for men for male specific attributes. You know, it's all about upper body strength and explosive power. Like that's what those sports are about. And that happens to be where men have a genetic superiority to, to most women. But the thing about it is, we as a species are not particularly strong or powerful or fast compared to other animals. Where we really shine is in two things, adaptability and endurance. Like that's what humans are all about. Like, so when you look at the sports that humans naturally evolved to perform, that's where you see the differences between men and women start to diminish. You know, look at like open water swimming. You know, it's like Diane Naya. Who was the first person to swim from Cuba to Florida? Like, it wasn't a dude. It was a 65-year-old woman. Um, you get into open water swimming. You get into ultra marathons. Things which require your brain and your stamina, that's where men and women tend to perform on a, an almost equal footing. And another sport that is like that is parkour. So I sort of edged into this by accident. You know, on, on the island of Crete, when I was researching these foot messengers, one thing you would see turn up again and again in histories of warfare in Greece is a thing called the Cretan bounce. People from Crete uh, were, were famous for this, this uh, ability to sort of almost bounce up and down mountains. They had this really kind of spring-like approach to running. And actually, there's, there's a belief that Pheidippides, the guy who actually ran, you know, marathon and created the, you know, the marathon, the messenger, uh, it's believed he actually came from, from Crete. Like the best foot messengers are always from Crete. So when I was looking into what this Cretan bounce was, it reminded me of videos I'd seen of people doing parkour, you know, that sort of jumping, landing, precision uh, approach. So I thought, oh, I wonder if there's some connection here. And then, of course, when you, when you start to look into it, when you see what the roots of parkour are, essentially it's just that. It's finding a way to move as efficiently um, and lightly across the landscape as possible. So I started to, to research parkour and learn parkour, and I was lucky to find this really cool, you'd love these people, a really cool all-female parkour troupe in the UK nice. on Thursday nights. And they just like rampage through the city, like jumping over shit. So I trained with them and had a, and had a blast. And what I found is, so you got to check out this video. There's a video called Movement of Three. Go on YouTube and check out Movement of Three, and you'll see three of the women who trained me. If you look at them, and if you saw them in dim lighting, you couldn't tell if they're male or female. Like when you look at parkour, you can't tell the difference between the genders because that is a sport that humans naturally evolved to do. And when it is that natural state, then men and women are basically the same. I do want to go backward though, because I think one of the most fascinating things you told me before your first book, you know, you went to Harvard, you were a war correspondent. I think, I think maybe you went and worked for the AP, but you once told me you were so broke that you had to choose as a, as a writer, you had to choose between either buns or ketchup for your hot dogs or maybe mustard and ketchup. Yeah, that was definitely mustard. Don't, mustard. Don't, 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 don't Not, accuse me of putting ketchup on a hot dog. Okay, I didn't think so. It was mustard. Okay. Mustard or, or buns or was it mustard or ketchup? That was it, mustard or buns. Mustard or buns. Okay. So so how did you like get this idea to then did you know that Born to Run would make you money or I mean as a writer it is really hard to make money. So I'd love to talk about, you know, your love and doing you know, everybody listening here to this podcast wants to make a living 
doing what they love. At least that's my guess. And that's what most people have written me told me. They want to make a living doing what they love. So I want to hear kind of your journey and, and any advice you can give to others on making that happen. Yeah, I've thought about this because, you know, you hear this advice, you know, follow your dream, follow your passion. And something about that advice always struck me as a little bit off. And, and I finally figured out what it is, is that, you know, I don't particularly love writing. Like, I'm going to have to sit down this afternoon and work on a chapter, and I'm going to think of everything I can possibly do <laughs> except sit down and work on the chapter. <laughs> so I, I don't particularly like the writing. I think what it is. What you're really getting at is rather than follow the thing you want to do, is avoid the thing you don't want to do. And to me, that's really what led me to writing is that there's a lot of other stuff I don't want to do. I don't want to be inside. I don't want to have a boss. I don't want to have regular hours. And anytime I've had that, I've pretty much gotten fired. So writing was kind of this thing that I like books, you know, I like words, um, but it was more of a default lifestyle for the otherwise uh, unemployable. And, and so once and I, I saw, I saw I'll tell you, Shelby, there was, there was a, there was a pivotal moment. Um, my dad only went to college because he was in Korea during the Korean war with the Marines. And he came out in the GI bill. And when I was five years old, he put himself through law school at night. And I, I remember this. I remember five years old, the day he passed the bar exam. And it was like, we had just conquered Mars. Uh, it was the most life-changing thing in my family's life. I just remembered like the hysteria in our family. Like, my dad passed the bar exam. He's now a lawyer. So all my life, the expectation was you got to become a lawyer. I mean, lawyer is the greatest thing you can ever do. My sister, my brother, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, they're all lawyers. But what I found was I just kept like postponing it. Like I, I just would apply to law school and I would get in and I would defer and then the deferment would run, would run out and I'd apply again and I'd get in and I'd defer. And this went on for like seven years. And finally, I know I'd taken this job at the Associated Press. Uh, I was working as a foreign correspondent based in Portugal, but working a lot in Angola and Rwanda and Congo. And the last time I had applied, I got into Temple Law School and I deferred and I tried to defer again. And I got a message from one of the admissions deans and they said, this is it. <laughs> you've applied twice, you've been accepted twice, you deferred three times. This is it. It's a yes or no. You have to ask yourself if you really want to go to law school because you cannot apply here anymore. We're not going to take your application anymore. And that was like that dark night of the soul. I think, Jesus Christ, like, you know, all I've written are 500 word news stories on a regular basis for the AP. I, I don't know if I can actually write anything more substantial. And this is like, this is the crossroads. And at that point I was like 32, 33, 34 years old. And it comes down to this. You can be a shitty lawyer and have a pretty good life. You can be a great writer and have a pretty shitty life. So which way you want to go, man? You know, it's like, I don't know if I can do this. And even if I'm pretty good, I can still be like waiting tables the rest of my life. Or you can go the safe route. Go to law school. Everyone's going to respect you. You'll find some way to make a buy. And I, I, was, so I, was, I was in Lisbon at the time. I'd just gotten off work. And I just spent like hours walking around just trying to think, man, which way do I go? So I called the law school the next day and said, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to do it. And that was it. And it was one of those great liberating moments where I thought, all right, man, this thing's off my ass now. For the first time in you know, 15 years, I'm not thinking about it anymore. And once you do that, man, like once you, once you walk out the door and the door locks behind you, then suddenly you get the fire in the belly. Like you got to make this thing work. So soon after making that decision, I uh, quit the AP, moved back to Philadelphia, where I'm from. Everyone was telling me like, if you want to be a freelancer, you got to be in New York. You got to go to New York. But I thought if everyone else is going to New York, then why am I going to go there? So I went back to, to Philly where I knew stuff and started freelancing stories out of Philly. And back then, you know, the first point of access was with the um, the free alt weeklies, you know, like City Paper and yeah. Philadelphia Weekly. So I started humping stories for the weeklies. And I remember there's one story I wrote. It was 5,000 words and I got $500. And that was it. You know, so 5,000 word story, you know how long that takes you. You know, I researched it for weeks. I ended up, you know, clearing 500 bucks. I feel and like that's the same going rate. 
Well, you know, it's funny because, uh, yeah, maybe it is now. And I, I feel like things have sort of, the tide has, has left me behind. But back then, if you were getting under a buck a word, man, that was, that was, that was low. You know, a, a buck a word minimum is what magazines were paying. Uh, it wasn't long before, you know, men's health and all was paying, you know, up, upwards of three bucks a word. So for a 5,000 word story, really rock bottom, you expect to get five grand. But if you're working for the alt weekly, so you get, you know, five or 600 bucks. Wow. So and that was, that was that, that moment when I walked into a convenience store and I really pulled the change out of my pocket and like, fuck, um, I can either buy the mustard or buy the bun. I already had hot dogs at home. I can't buy both of these. And I, and I, was, having, I was having this really hard decision. Like, well, what am I going to do here? Because I hate hot dogs without mustard. But I'm going to get more bang for the buck out of the bun. You know, and I can toast it tomorrow and actually have breakfast out of it too. And I was just sitting, standing there in front of the, 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 the um, convenience store trying to figure out, trying to like logic my way through this problem. And ultimately, I decided, well, I'll just buy the buns and just steal the mustard from somewhere else. And, you know, just go to like McDonald's and get some packets and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And then somehow I that your book took off. But at the time you wrote Born to Run, were you in a position where you had to start making money or were you already making money? Yeah. So here's how Born to Run shook out. So um, let's see. So I worked for the weekly for a while. I was never in the office. So first I was a freelancer. Then they hired me as staff. But then they never saw me because I was never in the office. So I got fired. I got fired from the Philadelphia Weekly after working there for like nine months because I was never there. And I go to work for Philadelphia Magazine. And a guy I'd become friends with, uh, a writer, had become the editor-in-chief. So he hires me. I'm working there for a couple of years. And things begin a little contentious with Philadelphia Magazine. Because if you work for a monthly city magazine after a while, you just keep doing the same shit over and over again. It's like these profiles, like local celebrities, like local sportscaster, you know, and you know, the, the guy who wants to be mayor. It's the same story over and over. So I was getting a little impatient with this kind of stuff. I didn't like doing it anymore. I've been doing stories for you know, Esquire and GQ, which I enjoyed more, but the bread and butter was still off the magazine. So I was constantly sort of getting at loggerheads with the editor, you know, who kept assigning these stories I didn't want to do. It took a shitload of time and they were just boring. So he and I were sort of spatting all the time. And then one day we got into an argument and I just said, look, dude, if you don't want me, just fucking fire me. Just fire me already. You know, why we keep doing this dance? Just fucking fire me. And he's like, fine, you're fired. I'm like, good. And I storm out of the office. And as I'm heading down the elevator, I'm like, oh, hang on a second. That's our only monthly salary and our only health care. And our second daughter had just been born a week and a half earlier. So as I'm riding down the elevator, like, oh, this is going to be a hard phone call to make back home. <laughs> hey, I just got rid of the check. And healthcare, and by the way, how's the baby doing? Um, but because of that, that's how I was able to do Born to Run. So I, I knew about this thing, the story. I was intrigued to do it, but I could never have gone down to the Copper Canyon because I was always committed to doing stuff in Philadelphia. But suddenly that commitment was gone, and so I was, you know, on a plane down to El Paso probably within a month, and that was the first time I ended up getting down there and meeting up with Caballo, and then that whole thing led to Born to Run. That's a wild story. Ah, oh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So you now live in Amish country. What what about, yeah. you know, Pennsylvania and in, in the country of where you live, do you love? So you know, I, I keep thinking like this is like the greatest undiscovered gem on earth. Like if everybody knew they'd all be here. But I get this I think I understand that wherever you are that you really like is your undiscovered gem. So it's probably not that remarkable, but I, just I don't know. I think people have discovered San Diego. It's like not a secret. <laughs> <laughs> they figured that out, huh? Yeah. La Jolla is not so bad. No. What happened was, you know, we were living in Philly. We wanted to get out of the city. And the only place we could afford was way out in the countryside in Lancaster County. And so we ended up buying this place out here in the middle of nowhere, not really knowing what we were getting in for. And it just turned out to be a dream. Uh, it's just quiet you know a car is not passed in front of the house all morning on the weekend the only traffic is amish horse and buggies to go by um because the amish had big farms they control most of the countryside around here so there's almost no development and yeah i just really i just really like it um i can go out my door and be on dirt trails connecting Amish farm to Amish farm. I can do like a, a two hour run and never touch asphalt. 
And it's also just messing around with, with animals too. We uh, we raise some sheep and goats and chickens, and now we have three donkeys that we've turned into our our running partner. We, we run with our donkeys. Okay, so this I want you to talk really briefly about the donkey runner running partner. I tell you, you know, Shelby, it actually turned out to be the coolest thing. We took in a donkey as a rescue animal, and we took it in, and it was in terrible shape, and. A woman, a friend of ours, was helping us bring him back to health. And she kind of gave me the old finger in the face treatment. She said, look, this animal has been through a lot. It's been neglected and abandoned. It is feeling despair. You cannot just like stick it in the field now and feed it apple cores. You got to give this thing a job. It has to feel a purpose. Mm-hmm. Like, what kind of job do you give a donkey? I'm not going to go like prospects. Like, what do you do? And then I, I knew about the burrow races in Colorado. Um, you know, there's a summer tradition in Colorado of having these races where the old prospectors would take their donkeys and they would, they would run, you know, 15 or 20 miles and have a race. And they still do it today. You know, there are about seven or eight towns in Colorado that every summer will have people show up with donkeys and they will run, you know, an ultra marathon. They'll do like a 29 mile race through the mountains, like Leadville, Fair Play, Buena Vista, all have these races. And I thought, you know, I wonder if I can take this, this donkey that was marked for death and rehabilitate it and actually train it to be my running partner. And so we started working on it. And then we ended up getting two other donkeys. My wife and a friend of ours got donkeys and we had the three of us. And it became this really super cool adventure. And I, I learned about how to partner with animals for the first time. And it's just been a kick. You know, you go out for a 15 mile run with a donkey, you're in for a much different experience. I have so many questions. Yeah, I really want to yeah. see a video of this. Um, really quick, we're going to do the rapid fire question round. So oh, these are okay. quick. So if you're right, fixing right. your bike, you got to focus. <laughs> okay, focus. Focus. Ready? Okay. Oh, and I want you to read this book, The Nature Fix by by Florence Williams. It's it's about like why we feel so much better in nature than in I the city. I wrote about that natural born here. Oh, there was so much information in that book, Chris. Advice you would give to your 15 year old self if you had to, if you could go meet him again. Keep doing what you're doing, man. Do not sacrifice being 15 for being 25. I got a 17 year old daughter now. I told her, you know, fuck the SATs. Just get outside and have a good time because it's all going to shake out anyway. Okay, dad of the year. Awesome. <laughs> Books <laughs> you love or gift most often besides your own. You probably don't even give your own. You're probably like too humble, but other books besides I'm yours. I'm trying to sell my own. I don't give it. Everybody I'm buy McDougal's it. book. We're going to link to tons of your books on this show. You know, a one book that I've been recommending like crazy is The Cloud Garden. You check it out. You'll, you'll blow your mind. It's all in an outside magazine. Check out The Cloud Garden. It is one of the craziest and best books I've come across. Awesome. Gear you always travel with. Luna Sandals, man. Uh, and this is not a plug for Ted. Lunas are amazing. They're just adaptable and they're super light. You can actually shove them in the back of your pants. They're, they're great. While running with your donkeys. Chia or- I, did, I did a 15 mile race with the donkeys wearing Luna sandals. How do you not get injured? Best advice for that? I think because, is that, is that tied into the gear question or is that a separate question? This is a separate question. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I think it actually is kind of the same thing. I, I think the more minimal you go, the more aware you are. So what I find is if I've got a boot or shoe on my foot, I'm clumping around like Frankenstein. If I am barefoot or in sandals, I'm super aware and I'm actually bending my knees and flexing my ankles. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was a question about the lunas, like how do you not get injured running with a donkey with lunas? But it does answer the question of how you not get injured is the more aware you are, the less you hurt yourself. Love that. Chia or hemp seeds? I never tried hemp seeds. Uh, so I'd have to go with the chia. Avocado or coconuts? Avocado, man. You know what? I am, uh, I'm, I'm part of the big vilified avocado toast fans. Ah, oh, yes. Parkour or surfing? I'm going to go surfing. Your writing process, quick and dirty. I remember you like to write. You do everything you can to not write all day and then... Maybe you write at night? Is that, is that how it works? Yeah. Yeah. I basically try and like drain the tank of energy during the day. So I'll just go out and run and load firewood and do all kinds of shit. And then when the sun starts to go down and I start to settle down a little bit, I'll um, just sit down and try and work into the, into the night. Okay. You can throw a party, any kind of party. Who's there? What's the theme? What's the food? 
It would be a quiet party. There would not be loud music. That's out of the way. Uh, it's going to be definitely, mm, it sounds kind of cliches. Okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to do it my way then. It's going to be on Mecu Beach in Portugal. And this is a great beach we used to go to all the time when I was working for the AP. We used to like blast out the door. You get to this beach in 20 minutes. So it'll be on Mecu Beach in Portugal, right outside of Lisbon. The food is going to be actually big old like wampin Portuguese stews, like big cauldrons of Portuguese stews. And I want to say to open to the public, but you want to screen out the ding dong. So I'm going to say it's open to the public, but you have to arrive there on foot. Yes. I knew you were going to say that. Awesome. Um, I think that way, you know, you got to do a kind of commitment to get there. Advice to people who want to write a book. (laughs) <laughs> the first thing, the first answer is don't. Uh, but that's 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 being that's being silly. I think the thing about it is, understand what is this story you want to tell. Not like what's the thing you're most impressed by or what you want to show off about yourself, but what is the story you want to tell. If you're sitting there in front of your family and they all turn towards you during Thanksgiving and you have everyone's attention and you're telling the story, you know it better be pretty fucking good or else they're gonna you know ridicule you. So if you're addressing your family and everyone has your attention and you're telling them the story, what is that story? And if you don't have that story, then I would say think twice about whether you really want to write that book because you're asking people to really step into your world and that world better be interesting. And so for me, it always begins and ends with stories. So here's what I would say then. If you want to write a book, then the first thing would be to go to one of these uh, story slam, like they have in bars, like poetry slams, but they have story slams. Go to a story slam. And if you can go up there and tell a five-minute story and capture people's imagination, then you can think about turning that into a book. Great advice. Advice to people listening who want to live more wildly. They want to be more free. You know, I think um, I'm 55 now, and you're, I'm not even going to ask, but like 25. So you probably have not gotten to this point in your life. No, yet. I'm 37. Somehow I got old. It's okay. Oh, really? Well, you're frozen in time. I bet you if I saw you, I'm still going to still, still see a 25-year-old. Yes, you know, I still but, act like a 25-year-old. <laughs> there you go. Here's the thing about it is that when I went back to like college reunions, I kept like finding friends who became corporate lawyers and like they're now like singer-songwriters or you know, they got married and they're divorced. And basically, everybody who charged out of the gates fast and did what they were supposed to do, almost all of them ended up regretting it. You know, that they got married young, not because they were like in love or what, just because they like, they sort of felt like they had to. And then they got BMWs and they, they did the stuff that they were supposed to do. Those are the ones that would end up reversing course later on. I, I guess the way to break out is actually do more of a slow burn. Like, what is it you really feel like? What is it you don't want to do? And avoid that. And then find a way to actually, you know, be satisfied with doing what you like every day. <laughs> I just feel like the more I talk, the more I, I edge into cliche. But I think the thing about it is that, you know, you, you have to decide for yourself like what victory is, uh, what, what winning is. You know, if you, if you watch every really good sports movie, it's never about winning the championship. Like the, the underdog decides for herself or himself what victory is. And so with Rocky Balboa, it's not about beating Apollo Creed. His victory is if I can just be on my feet at the end, that's victory. You know, white men can't jump. If I could just dunk the ball, that's victory. And so that, that's, I think, what it is, is deciding for yourself what victory is and pursue that and forget the stuff that you're supposed to, to want and do. That is the best piece of advice ever. We're going to have to end on that. Chris, where can people find out more? And we'll have links on where to buy your books, but, but what's the best place to follow you or find you? Well, first come to my beach party in Meku, arrive by foot. <laughs> that's step one. Uh, but yeah, you know, I've, I've got a website, you know, chrismcdougal.com. And yeah, uh, stuff's there. Uh, I'm on Twitter, McDougal Chris. So those two places. It has been such a pleasure, Chris. Thanks for being such a great mentor, a friend, and an amazing writer. Just love your work. Shelby, I had such a blast with you. I'm going to feel like we have this bond, this emotional bond forever. Thank you for listening to this show. Chris, thank you for coming on and always sharing your wisdom. 
We'll have links on the story Chris and I did for the Adventure Journal, how to get his books, and more in the show notes on wildideasworthliving.com. Thanks to my friend Dave Shanker for taking me to Chris's book signing in 2011, to the Adventure Journal for publishing that story, to Emily, my new friend helping me with social media, and mostly to you for your comments and your support. I'm always open to feedback, ideas, and anything you like, didn't. I'm always working to improve this podcast. Wherever you are in the world, don't forget, some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. We'll see you next week. We have Captain Lizzie Clark. 